Our topic tonight is Turkish foreign policy and Turkish-American relations in an era of change. Um, the number of things passing through the minds of everyone when that title is read are numerous, of course. We all have our own long list of aspects of uh, Turkey's foreign policy and uh, relations with the United States, which are of, of deep interest to us. We're concerned about the internal affairs in Turkey, the direction of the nation. We're concerned about the relationship with Europe in the longer run, uh, your relations with your neighbors, the role that you play in a rapidly changing Middle East, uh, an era of change uh, about the outcomes of which we don't know, and, uh, but the phenomenon of change is, is quite clear. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone we'd rather be discussing anything with tonight than with the ambassador of Turkey to the United States. Uh, ambassador Tan, with a degree in law from Ankara University, uh, has been in the foreign service of his nation since 1982, uh, almost three decades. Uh, during that first dec decade, he was in the Department of Maritime Affairs. He served in the embassy in Moscow and uh, in Abu Dhabi. And he returned to be a deputy uh, head of uh, cabinet to the president of Turkey. And in the following decade had extensive experience here in the United States. Uh, two four-year uh, tours here, first as uh, uh, embassy counselor and then later as first counselor in the Turkish embassy with a uh, chore of uh, chief of cabinet for the Minister of Foreign Affairs interspersed between. He returned and was the head of the Department of the Americas. And then in the next decade, uh, uh, among his positions were heading up the uh, Information Department, uh, three years as uh, spokesman for the Foreign Ministry, uh, two years plus as Ambassador of Turkey to Israel, and then as a Deputy Undersecretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, as I said, I, I can't imagine a more interesting evening than this one promises to be. It, uh, it's with exhilaration and a great deal of pleasure that I present to you uh, Narik Tan, Ambassador of Turkey to the United States. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> um, it's, it's more than an honor for me to be before you this evening. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it is um, a special day for me because this city is actually one of my favorite cities uh, all over the United States. And I remember my kids uh, who are grown up now, um, they are back in Turkey and I miss them a lot, I should tell you. And they used to take me, you know, sometimes forcefully. Then, of course, uh, 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 they, they like this place, they like this harbor and everything. So um, we used to come quite often. And since my last arrival to this uh, wonderful country, United States, uh, this is my first time, unfortunately, that I'm coming to this lovely city. So 
this is uh, my first observation. Uh, the second one is that I should thank you all, you know, in preferring my speech to the game of Orioles with Kansas City. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm really thankful to you. This is a, a special gesture by all of you to me. Uh, <clears throat> thirdly, I should warn you, as is uh, very well explained, uh, and I was impressed by listening my own CV. I mean, <laughs> what I have done in three decades. Uh, um, and uh, <clears throat> I was the spokesperson of the foreign ministry, so I was paid to speak for, for many years. So I like speaking. <laughs> um, therefore, you should stop me if I go too far. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, I'm delighted to be here with you today. It is a distinct pleasure for me to address this distinguished gathering. I'm impressed and gratified by the strong interest of the audience to this event. Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs is an example of educated interests of American people to the world developments. Let me first thank Frank Bird, President of the Board of Trustees, who was kind enough to give me the opportunity to speak here. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Turkey has always been at the epicenter of many important events. This is not a deliberate choice, of course. Our geography and our unique historical experience compel us to be an important player in various issues of global importance. Indeed, the Iranian nuclear issue, the instability in Iraq, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the conflicts in the Caucasus, former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and the Cyprus question are just a few of the globally important issues that demand our involvement. Apart from a short period of relief and optimism after the Cold War, there has hardly been a year which was not overshadowed by these and other conflicts. This was certainly made, this has certainly made our jobs as Turkish diplomats more interesting and also more demanding at the same time. Adding to this heavy agenda, we now face a new set of dramatic and historic events in our region. Indeed, four months ago, none of us would have predicted that NATO planes would be flying over Libya. Similarly, few, if any, any of us could have anticipated that the decades-long rule of power holders in Egypt and Tunisia would end in a matter of weeks without much violence. These changes raise high hopes as well as many questions about the future. We are certainly encouraged that the dignity and will of the people prevailed in Egypt and Tunisia. But we also hope that the transition toward a democratic system will be smooth and peaceful, catering to the needs and demands of the people. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to explain how Turkey views these dramatic changes and why a strong Turkish-US partnership is essential to help the people in our region enjoy the benefits of democracy and freedom. Turkey's message to our region has been consistent for years. As early as 2003, Turkish President Abdullah Gül, in his former capacity as foreign minister, 
called on the Organization of Islamic Conference member states in Tehran. I put a bold line to the word Tehran, the capital of Iran, to put their houses in order as a matter of utmost priority. He stressed the importance of democratic principles, respect for fundamental rights and freedoms, rule of law, good governance, transparency, and accountability. In this context, Turkey shares the same vision with the US and the international community for the achievement of democratic rights and freedoms in the Middle East and beyond. Let me underline that our position on the recent developments is not dri driven by self-interest or a desire to expand influence. Our main guiding principle has been universal values. That is why, although the first tide of events in Tunisia and Egypt caught many by surprise, the Turkish government did not hesitate to deliver a clear message at an early stage. We called on the leaders of these countries to meet the demands of the people. Turkey, Turkey's position regarding Libya has also been unambiguous. While Turkey has upheld the independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Libya, we stress that the use of violence against civilians is unacceptable. We avoided sensational rhetoric, but we made it clear that transformation should take place in a peaceful way without threatening the peace and security of the people. Our leaders made clear calls to the Libyan leader to meet the demands of his people. Prime Minister Erdogan urged Colonel Gaddafi to leave and pay the way for a peaceful transition in Libya. The Prime Minister has renewed his call several times over the last month. We also called for an end to violence and attacks against civilians in Benghazi, Tripoli, Misirata, and other Libyan cities. We have been in touch with opposition groups in Benghazi and met their representatives in Ankara, and indeed, Mustafa Abdul Jalili, chairman of Libya Trans uh, National Transitional Council, visited Ankara as late as yesterday and met with the president, prime minister, and foreign minister of our country. Our messages, our message to the Transitional National Council in Benghazi was lucid. It is of utmost importance that their struggle lead to an out outcome that embraces all Libyans. Turkey fully supports United Nations Security Council resolutions 1970, which condemned the use of lethal force by Muammar Gaddafi's regime against protesters, as well as resolution 1973, which called for an immediate ceasefire and authorized the establishment of a no-fly zone over Libya. We have been at the forefront of the discussions with NATO, within NATO, as the alliance did in Bosnia and Kosovo in the past and is doing again in Afghanistan at the moment. Turkey wanted NATO to make sound decisions in accordance with its well-established principles and mechanisms. Our message to our Syrian government, to Syrian government was also uh, not different. Equality, freedom, justice, and democracy are the legitimate and natural rights for all humanity. To postpone, delay, or worse, to ignore the most basic human rights is, an, is an unacceptable. We no longer want to see bloodshed fears and oppression in our neighborhood. While the world is rapidly changing, 
It's not acceptable for countries to oppress their peoples. Freedom and democracy are indispensable for our own people. It's also indispensable for our Arab brothers. Regardless of their religious or sectarian differences, they should enjoy those same fundamental rights and freedoms. Ladies and gentlemen, external forces do not drive the tide of change in the Middle East. Perhaps for the first time in the history, the people are deciding their future. This time, change is driven from within. For us, this is the fundamental tenet of the recent developments. During the initial days of the public unrest in Egypt and Tunisia, we have not seen anti-Western protests or angry people burning US flags. The people control this process. And it is vital that we do not take steps that will undermine local ownership by the people. Local ownership is vital for the long-term success of, uh, of this transformation. Ad hoc military operations or social engineering attempts run the risk of being perceived as Western interventions and could turn the larger masses against outside powers. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the road to democracy can be long, challenging, and painful. Turks know this well. Our country is always trying to reach higher levels of democratic standards. There is no room for instant coffee approaches. And every country has its own peculiar characteristics and therefore a unique path to peace and stability. Turkey is eager to help its friends and neighbors. To help could be this the help could be either direct as is seen in our humanitarian assistance efforts and concrete contribution to the NATO mission in Libya with five frigates, one submarine, one naval support vessel, and six F 16s. Or it can be indirect by setting an example and by being a source of inspiration to millions in the region. I should also underline that Turkey has been sending humanitarian aid to Benghazi from the day we started evacuating some 30,000 Turkish and about 50 other countries' citizens. Indeed, we are proud to be a vibrant democracy among the 57 nations with predominantly Muslim populations. For those in Tahrir Square or elsewhere in the Middle East who search for dignity and a better life, Turkey gives hope and inspiration. However, we no longer want to be an exception. All nations, we believe, deserve free and fair elections. We see rule of law, transparency, and free market economy as the insurance of peace and prosperity all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the process is long and we may see similar changes in other parts of the region. Therefore, the international community, especially the Western world, should act with utmost diligence. This is where Turkish-US partnership matters most. I'm happy to note that from the initial days of the developments, our governments have engaged in close dialogue. Prime Minister Erdogan and Foreign Minister Davutoglu have had numerous conversations with President Obama and Secretary Clinton in recent weeks. We tried hard to calibrate our messages. We tried hard not to undermine the local ownership of the changes. Dear guests, the events once again demonstrated the vital importance of our relationship. 
Turkey is a vital ally of the United States, and our relationship with the U.S. is a vital pillar of our foreign policy. There have been ups and downs in our bilateral relationship, something that even best friends experience. However, the relationship is dur durable and capable of recovering quickly after every incident. Now, as we witness the turning of an important page in the history of the Middle East, we again come to grasp with the level of importance of this vital partnership. And uh, for the sake of, of course, interactive discussion, I will conclude my remarks here. Always I used to get a signal from my wife. She's not here. So I will stop myself, as I said. Uh, and uh, before taking your questions, let me once again thank Baltimore Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs for giving me this uh, opportunity. Thank you. We certainly thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Professor Friedman first. The question is, uh, why call the PKK, Kurdish terrorist group, a terrorist group, and why not label Hamas, which has the same practices, similarly a terrorist group? Well, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a question that we face almost in every audience here. Um, and uh, the, uh, the thing is that I served in Israel probably uh, uh, more than actually two years, close to three years. And I spent three wonderful years in, in, that, in that wonderful country. Um, and our relations with Israeli people is uh, and was and I hope will be uh, next to none. And I believe these two countries, their relationship is the insurance of peace and stability in a very volatile neighborhood. You're looking at the neighborhood from 10,000 kilometers away. 10,000 kilometers, ladies and gentlemen. But if you take a moment and close your eyes and put yourself into our place and just imagine yourself waking up every morning with a long list of uh, complications starting from, this is only one of them fighting with terrorism. This is only one of them, unfortunately. It's not the only one. You can have a, a list, just you go counterclockwise or counterclockwise, whichever way you like. You will see Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, the whole Middle East, the entire Northern Africa, Caucasus, uh, Russia, Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean and energy issues, fight against terrorism. This is the agenda we face every day. The difference is that US also faces the same agenda every day. But the difference is we're right next to all those complications, not like yourself, two neighborly and friendly countries and two oceans. I wish we were somewhere here. <laughs> that would have been quite different. That would give you a different perspective, believe me. Once you are right next to a neighbor, uh, I, I just enumerated to you. I don't want to be undiplomatic. So this is, this is the challenge that we have. And now, 
this country, ladies and gentlemen, has another uh, differentiating uh, 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 special, uh, I think, value that, that uh, maybe sometimes you easily miss. That's we are a Muslim majority country. We are a Muslim majority country. What did this Muslim majority country do when Israel first uh, founded itself and declared its independence? It took a decision on its own. We were not paid anything. We haven't negotiated any peace deal or something. We did it on our own. We recognized Israel right after the United States. We are the second after the United States. And since then, 63 years of uninterrupted relationship. But we are hot-blooded Mediterraneans. <laughs> you may not understand or quite feel what this statement means. We can deal with ourselves. You know, among ourselves, we can just solve our problems easily. But when you sit 10,000 kilometers away, you be more emotional. For understandable reasons, I respect that. But the ball game in that part of the world is so different, ladies and gentlemen. It's very different. It is very different. So, um, in that context, that I would tell you that you cannot find any single, and I challenge you, any single statement from my prime minister or my president, the sitting ones, the previous ones, or any other political leader challenging the right of existence of uh, uh, Israel as an independent country in the international recognized borders. We've never done it, and we will never do it. During my time, at least I can speak for my time, we have invested millions of dollars to several other projects. They are now pending. They are on the shelf because of the, the present situation in our relationship, unfortunately. But one last thing that I should tell you, please, we owe this relationship to our forefathers who have brought this relationship from 519 years ago to this date. We owe them. So we cannot compromise this relationship. Don't make any mistake. We will never do this. We will put this behind. We have made several calls. We have asked for an apology. Apology is only between friends. Enemies do not apologize. So you'll see, and I hope dearly, as a person who has invested a lot of time and effort to this relationship, I truly believe that we will put all those differences behind. And in that case, uh, some some sort of rhetorical uh, you know comments also fade away and we will move on the, the question was uh, the attack upon a Turkish ship attempting to go to Gaza uh, how did that uh, af affect relations with Israel well I let me tell you this this is another good question but it doesn't need need any I think explanation or definition or any further uh, comment on, I mean, it, it's obvious the effect was disastrous. But let me tell you this, again, one thing. 
So I don't want to just elaborate on it, but I'll tell you one thing. If I were trusted and uh, entrusted that operation, I'm a diplomat. I have no idea about military uh, things. But I would have done better. This is one of the most sophisticated armies of the Mediterranean, the Israeli Defense Forces. And that was a very clumsy operation. And I think we would have never expected such an action to be taken against uh, that ship, which was really, I think, real tragedy. And now we've got nine dead bodies. I ask you, all of you, if you were uh, the political figures uh, in, in your specific countries, uh, or if you were the people who were running Turkey, you would receive this question that we are receiving on a daily basis. What have you done against those killings? Our citizens are dead. They were killed by a friendly force. So what have you done? We have done nothing, ladies and gentlemen. We've only called, pulled back our ambassador, and that's all about it. Now they ask questions. Is this, is this the thing that, that we sh you should do? Is it enough to respond this, to this uh, very, very important challenge? Nine dead bodies. So we tell our Israeli friends, you have to come, come and apologize. The same thing happened between United States, or a similar thing, not the same thing exactly, in 1994. An American frigate fired a missile to a Turkish frigate during an exercise in Aegean, you know, almost one and a half decades ago. What the American response to our calls was immediate apology and compensation. Does any one of you sitting in this, in this uh, room do remember such a thing? Maybe one or two, uh, but nobody remembers it. Nobody remembers it. This is the way this thing should be uh, handled. So we ask our Israeli friends, I make a bold mark again, Israeli friends, that they should as early as possible, make an apology of some sort so that we can go to our people and say, look, our friends have apologized. So we have to just put this behind and we should move on because Israel needs Turkey now and Turkey needs Israel and the region needs both countries and the United States need both allies, hand in hand, working for peace and stability in the region. There are two questions. Yeah. Um, first of all, the Israeli government turned a uh, uh, accused terrorist over to your government. Yes. The gentleman would like to know what happened. And then secondly, he wants to know what you're doing with the exchange rate. The exchange rate? Well, well there, there was a... The, the, uh, the price of a dinner, $70, was a, a huge amount of Turkish money. And well, uh, I can tell you this. I mean, let's start from uh, the reverse order. We are no longer millionaires. <laughs> um, we're no longer as such. Turkey today, as we speak, is the, the one sick man of Europe, now the healthiest man of Europe. You can go and Google and check out from wherever you like, whichever angle you like to go. 
to whom you uh, would uh, like to speak, Turkey is the greatest economy in Europe and in, in the uh, all surrounding regions. Now Turkey uh, has a powerful money and it's, I mean so powerful not like uh, the days uh, that you have uh, you, you, you were just alluding to. So um, if you go to Turkey of course you would the exchange rate is still uh, uh, I mean US uh, dollar is uh, of course much more valuable uh, uh, than our money but uh, it's not like millions of Turkish liras that you would get any longer. This, the, the first question is uh, the person the, the, the terrorists of all terrorists I mean for us um, that terrorist let me just make you an analogy how you feel about Osama bin Laden? That's how we feel about him. This man has caused, uh, I think, an enormous uh, uh, trouble for, for our people, for, uh, I think, for complicating things in Turkey and for the killing of thousands of people. So I can simply tell you, we cannot, <laughs> we, <laughs> we cannot thank United States enough for giving a helping hand for the apprehension of this terrorist. We cannot thank enough. United States, is the first and only, I mean, at the time, country which recognized PKK as a, a terrorist organization. And we cannot thank United States enough. Today, we are fighting together against terrorism of all, every kind, and we cannot thank United States support enough. Why? is United States doing this? Because we have shared the same faith, unfortunately, in falling victim to several uh, terrorist attacks. Several of them being coming from Al-Qaeda. In Turkey, we've lost 67 uh, uh, of our uh, citizens in different three different attacks of, of Al-Qaeda. So that's the man. You know, sitting in the jail uh, uh, now, and uh, you know, paying the price for what he did, and he will continue to be there. Would you comment upon uh, Turkey's progress in becoming a member of the EU? With great pleasure. <laughs> um, with great pleasure, uh, and I'm. I'm very much pleased for this question. This is, uh, this is my favorite. <laughs> Why, especially in this country? This country, you're so lucky, ladies and gentlemen. You may not be aware of this, but you should understand as a foreigner, I'm telling you. And please trust me, you're living in a country, in a land of big thinking. The people here are taught to think big. So you are lucky to be member, members of this great society. You cannot find big thinkers too, ma too much in some other places. Uh, don't make me undiplomatic. But this is the way I can, I mean, this is that much I can put it in, in a diplomatic way. Especially in our region, things are different. So why I'm telling this? That's why 
why I am very much pleased because you would understand me when I explain what we think about EU. This is a 150 year long struggle and aspiration for the Turkish people to be a member or to be a part of the uh, actually the values that we all cherish together in the civilized world. And some of our friends in Europe came up with a project, a civilization project. They said, these are the values, accountability, uh, trust, transparency, tax, rule of law, um, and you name it. I mean, uh, several other things, parliamentary democracy uh, uh, or democracy, secularism, many others that you also cherish here. So they said, well, we said, this is great. We have to be a part of this. As a Muslim country, we have to be volunteering first to go and be a member of it. We have to challenge ourselves because that club, that civilization club, had some rules. They said, you have to fulfill this, you have to fulfill that, and this and that. It continues. We accepted that. We went there. The rule was simple. They said, if you fulfill everything, you'll become a full member. That was the, that's uh, as simple as that. Uh, nothing uh, to be understood uh, differently. And everyone got the same treatment, except Turkey. When we start negotiating with them, they started also to play with the rules of the game, each and every day. And it didn't work for them to stop us because we were fulfilling everything. They made a very, very, I think, uh, unacceptable statement. And this statement is still alive. They say, well, we're negotiating. That's good, and you're trying hard, but don't make any mistake. You won't be a, a, a full member anyway you know, at the end of the day. But let's me negotiate. So this is not fair. That's the thing. Well, they should judge us through our performance. I mean, if they come and say, well, the freedom of speech, the standards are not high enough in your country. So you have to work hard to fulfill that, that standard. That's fair. And some other performances, uh, some other benchmarks could be put before us. But when you say you will not be a member at the very end, then how am I going to talk to my own people? The people will decide. The people say, who, who the hell they think they are, you see? <laughs> How can they just uh, judge us through some very uh, subjective, uh, uh, you know? Anyway, one last thing. Uh, they will come to understand that we are not uh, for EU to go and get our share from the existing cake. We we are almost confident that one day when they start thinking big, then they would come to terms with the reality that if we go in, we will make the cake bigger and we will take our share. The question is in terms of assistance, what do you think of enablement via something like a Marshall Plan uh, for the Palestinians? Well. Uh, <clears throat> look, the money, of course, the funds are important. Uh, I have no doubt about that, and I cannot underestimate, and no one should underestimate the funds and everything. That funds cannot change the mentality. This is the problem. I mean, 
First, we have to build this trust between these two communities. There is a great, great divide between the two communities. I mean, um, that's why my experience personally when I was in Israel, I have, uh, I was just seeing uh, probably uh, more than a dozen projects between these two, uh, you know, uh, opposing uh, communities, mainly Israel and, and the Palestinians. Um, and we had several investment from, from all over the world. But this is not the case. I mean, yes, it helps. It helps a lot. I, I'm not just, again, underestimating it. Well, it, it shouldn't be the only case, uh, only thing. We should, um, uh, first of all, I think uh, there are certain non-starters when you look at the positions of both sides, which I won't go in uh, in detailing them, uh, we have to to bridge those those uh, those gaps, which is which is not an easy thing, and I'm sh I'm very sorry to say that I'm not quite optimistic for for a, a very I think quick and very um, easy solution of the. Order. Germany? Yes, they were the recipients of the Marshall Plan. Yeah, I think, no. Uh, the, the, the question was, is there an, uh, an analogy between the Marshall Plan and Germany on one hand yeah. and the Palestinians on the other? Uh, well, I think, uh, um, do you think, uh, maybe a, a, a counter uh, question to you, do you think we can just even today come up with such an incredible uh, uh, thing like in the form of Marshall Flynn today? I, we're not going to give her a chance to answer that. She, yeah. she, the, her, well, this, her answer this, is this, yes. This, and this is expensive. our challenge. This is our challenge. The question is, uh, what do you see as the end point in Afghanistan from the Turkish point of view? Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> look, I think uh, uh, I have enough, enough experience to answer many of the questions, but I'm not a magician. <laughs> um, I'm, um, it, is, uh, it is a one million dollar question. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. Um, but I can tell you this. Turkey, uh, from, the, from the very beginning, when this whole NATO operation started, Turkey stood uh, right besides the United States and today Turkey doing maybe many of you wouldn't know this or maybe some of you may have heard some parts of what I would say as uh, as a fact that we have commanded the ISAF forces uh, which is the uh, uh, peace and stability forces in 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 uh, in Afghanistan three times and we are now uh, commanding the security forces around Kabul for the second time we're running two different provincial uh, 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 reconstruction teams there and we're working very closely with our allies there but our PRTs are right next to each other, American and uh, Turkish PRTs. American PRT are always under attack, you know, of some sort. Turkish PRT, never. <laughs> when Turkish forces go and walk on the streets of Kabul, everyone welcomes and gives them more a warm embrace. And some of our allies' forces, when they feel like they are threatened, they put the Turkish insignia on their <laughs> shoulder to save them. You know, that's the value. That's the value. That's the legitimacy that we bring into this whole effort. 
So we do uh, our utmost to contribute to the efforts of peace and stability in Afghanistan. But I believe uh, what is going to happen there, this should be the people of Afghanistan, not us to decide for their destiny. Yes. Mr. Shore. Yeah, we have two PRT teams there. One is, uh, Provincial uh, reconstruction teams, Th they, they do civic work, meaning, no, I have to, uh, this is a good question, thank you for, for making this, uh, uh, so for uh, bringing some clarity into this. What we do, we have been operating 26 girls schools there, schools for the people of Afghanistan, for the kids of Afghanistan, but girls. We're running 16 hospitals, 16, one six. We are building bridges. We are trying to make the life comfortable for the Afghan people. Now, military means, of course, this is something, but these kind of, uh, I think, help is indispensable. That's why we are the good face of the NATO forces everywhere, in, 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 in elsewhere also, in Kosovo, in Bosnia, we are there, we, are, we, are, we have been everywhere, and we will keep on just uh, uh, aiding the missions of uh, UN and NATO. The question well, is, if yeah. you withdrew troops from yeah. Cyprus, the and, and the settlers, would that make your case automatically positive well, for um, the EU? Again, this is another good question that I, I like to, uh, to respond, uh, it's a wonderful question. That's right. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, exactly the case, and that's why, that's why, um, sir. Several years ago, and I'm sure you have, you must have followed. We are asked by the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to accept a resolution. I mean, a, 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 a plan that was exactly the solution of entire problem. And he said, if you cannot agree among yourselves, I mean, to the Turkish and Greek Cypriots, you should bring the motherlands, you know, like Greece and Turkey. And we all just gathered in Bürgenstock, where I was present, luckily. And we negotiated a paper, a plan. And we couldn't agree on certain points. The UN Secretary General said, this problem should go away. So I will fill in the missing parts of this agreement. We said, OK, you can do this. We have the trust that you can. Our, uh, uh, I mean, Greek friends and uh, especially the Greek Cypriots, they refused. But at the end of the day, they had to because they were going to be blamed as the party was undermined that, that plan. So that plan came out. One thing was required. It was put to referenda in both parts of Cyprus. The people themselves, they will decide whether they agree or not. And it is put before referenda in each side. Turkish Cypriots, and we supported it as Turkey. And Greece was supposed to support it, and they, they did. You know, at least they stayed neutral. But the, then President Papadopoulos of Greek Cypriot side, he cried on the TV. He cried before his people. Why? To make them say no to an agreement. And at the end of this referendum in Turkey, I mean in the Turkish Cypriot side, 68% or 70 percent 
yes, as opposed to the same uh, measure, no, on the other side. So if we had agreed then, and it, the agreement was there, today there was no Turkish troops, no nothing, and that would be a united Cyprus. So who's to blame there? Tell me. Well, Mr. Mr. Shor would also like to know if that happened, would that gain you entrance to the EU? Uh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm not so sure because they can just create other obstacles. Uh, if they had, uh, you know, that statements saying that you would never become, you are, you're not a part of Europe. I mean, uh, what qualifies them to say this? I don't know. Uh, uh, how do your people feel about bombing another well, Muslim they, country? They well, will, they will not feel good. <laughs> of course, as, as I have told you, you know, the principles of our policy is very, very uh, clear. We don't want to go through any military means. We don't want any military means to be used to anybody. We want everything to be done through uh, uh, peaceful ways. Peaceful means. That's why, again, you know, just uh, uh, maybe uh, it's, uh, it's, it's also a follow-up to what I said a, a while ago. That's why we are trying to keep engaged with everybody. There is no other country in our region. And again, I have m many times challenged you, but let me challenge you one last time. You cannot find any other country on the face of the earth who could talk to anyone in our region. Any single group, any single faith, any single race, any single orientation, we can talk. That's what makes us different from others. And we invest all our ability to the way of peace. When we talk, we talk for peace. We talk for stability. We are sick and tired of this uh, really uh, uh, very, very troublesome uh, complications all around our country. We want a peaceful neighborhood. We want a peaceful neighborhood, so we don't like weapons of any kind. Of course, we want to use our soft power together with our hard power. We have one of the finest hard powers, by the way. So we always combine both of them as a smart power. That's what we have learned from big thinkers. <laughs> Thank you. We, we clearly thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for a most interesting and uh, all-too-short evening. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.